discussion of the Wild Chapatulas by Brian Wagner. Woo! Let's give it up. Woo! So I see a few new faces that I have never seen in this room before. So what I'm gonna do really quickly is give you guys a quick spiel about what you're here for. And then we'll introduce a couple special guests and then we'll get rolling with this discussion. So I'm the executive director of not only this festival, but also the nonprofit that directs it. It's called One Book, One New Orleans. One Book, One New Orleans every year selects one book. We encourage everyone in the city to read the same book at the same time with the idea that we're going to grow stronger as a community through a shared reading experience. But when we do that, we have to recognize that approximately one in four adults here in New Orleans struggles with access to literacy. So I develop a curriculum around that one book that we select every year, and we get that book and its curriculum free of charge into the hands of adult education programs throughout the city. We also get that book into the adult and juvenile detention facilities throughout the state of Louisiana. We get the book into the ears of the blind and print handicapped through a partnership with WRBH Reading Radio. And last but not least, we make sure that if you love to read but you can't afford to get a book, that your book is available at the New Orleans Public Library. We give at least three copies per branch to all 15 branches. And then we have a series of free family-friendly events so you don't have to worry about childcare in different neighborhoods throughout the city so that if your barrier is transportation, you know we're coming to your neighborhood at least once a year. Now that's where I would have stopped in 2020. But in 2020, a lot of folks started contacting us and saying, our people lost access to books because public schools and public libraries shuttered. So we started collecting any book for any reading level and giving them out to different organizations who serve folks who have lost access. To this day, we have given out over 6,000 just to DePaul Community Health Centers. And 2022 alone, it's 4,833 books right now in the community to people that would have normally lost books. That's, if you see the QR codes around saying support our work, that's what you're supporting. So thank you very much for being here. And I want to recognize a couple of really special folks for this conversation. We've got Dan, Dr. Ansel Augustine. He is the medicine man of the Wild Chapatulas. Give it up. And in the back there, we've got Isaiah Neville. Isaiah is the great, great nephew of Big Chief Jolly and the son of Ivan Neville. Give it up for Isaiah. We're introducing them, obviously, because Brian's book directly talks about them and their families, the Wild Chapatulas. Brian Wagner, he's a professor of English at the University of California, Berkeley. His books include Disturbing the Peace, Black Culture and Police Power After Slavery, The Life and Legend of Bra Coupe, which he'll be talking about at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, right here in this room, and of course, The Wild Chapatulas. He also directs the Multidisciplinary Digital Archive, Louisiana Slave Conspiracies. And joining him is Melissa A. Weber, a researcher, historian, writer, and educator whose areas of interest and expertise include New Orleans, music and culture, 20th century black American popular music, and archives. She's the curator of the archives of Tulane University Special Collections, the music archives. She's also a teacher of a history of urban music at Loyola University's College of Music and Media. And in her spare time, and I'm using that in quotes because you're very busy, you are also under the moniker DJ Soul Sister, and you're internationally known as a vinyl collector, veteran WWOZ FM show host of your Soul Power radio show, which features 1970s to mid 1980s soulful rarities from your personal collection of thousands of records. Melissa has performed from, with everyone from Questlove to George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. Fun fact, after I had my first kid, 
Melissa opened for P Funk at my first return to normalcy event after having my first baby. So thank you so much, Melissa. It was real normal that night. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa and Brian. <laughs> Thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you all for being here. Before we get into the book, which I have to mention is part of a series put out by Bloomsbury Academic. It's a, the series is called 33 and a Third, and it's a series of books about music albums. So there are lots of them. There are like hundreds of them. So before we get into the Wild Top of Tulis, why, why did you decide to do a book for this series and then why this album? Yeah, yeah. this is a great question. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Melissa, for doing this. This is, um, this is great. Um, yeah, no, so it's a series I've always really liked a lot. I, you know, the world of 33 and a Third and also like the pop conference that I, I know you know well, it's a world that brings together journalists and academics who are thinking about popular music. And so that was an exciting kind of world for me. It's also the case, though, that I grew up here, so I'm a New Orleanian. Um, I, um, about eight or so years ago, got a bug to start thinking about my hometown and writing about things. And so I, I did a, a few projects, including the Brock Coupe project, and this is something I really I really wanted to do. And so that's that's the kind of basic answer to it. It was part of you know, a, several projects um, related to, to New Orleans that I've undertaken. Um, recently, why the Wild Chop Tools is an interesting question, though. You know, because like a lot of people have asked me, well, why not the Wild Magnolias, who kind of came first, right? You know, I, I initially thought I was going to write it about Rejuvenation, which is this incredible Meters album, their first Warner Brothers album. Um, and I think I probably, in the end, chose the Wild Chop Tools. I mean, there, there, there are no bad choices there, right? Like, those are all incredibly important records. Um, I think I chose the Wild Chop Tools because there's a way in which it more immediately encompasses the whole of New Orleans music. Right, so it takes you back to R&B, like through the early careers of Hart and Aaron Neville, you know, the Hawkettes, you know, like all, all of the, the meters, you know, the birth of the Neville brothers, you know, as well as the ways in which the Mardi Gras Indian tradition got taken into the popular music of the city in the 1970s. Alan Tucson and C. Saint Studios, you know, it felt like in a lot of ways it was it was, it was an album that brought together so much. And so that might have been why I chose this one in particular. Okay, well you just touched on a lot of um, so many key points of the book. And it's not just about the album. It is literally about the culture of Mardi Gras Indians, about the birth of the Neville brothers, the Neville family, the meters, and of New Orleans Rhythm and Blues. So, so start us off with um, with with the basis of what someone would have to know going into reading this book. Well, hopefully you don't need to know too much before you, before you um, you get into the book. But it is true that you know, all of these traditions are really complicated. Maybe we can start to break them down so we can think about Mardi Gras Indians or Black Masking Indians. That's something to know about. Um, the Neville family is very important to know about in their long history in the city. Um, and then, crucially, you know, just to, to say it again, this is the, you know, really the last, you know, time the meters play together on a record, you know, before they break up for the first time, and it's the first time the four Neville brothers play together. Uh, it's New Directions after that. I, just, I, I might have just misspoken. There might be one more meters record after. Yeah. Um, but um, but um, this is the kind of the end of the original meters and the beginning of the Neville brothers. So this is very important. Um, in terms of what we might need to know, though, um, why don't we start and think about um, the Neville family? How about we do that? Um, so, um, so you know, uh, you know, Art and um, Aaron and Charles and Cyril. Um, Cyril's a little bit younger, but they're kind of born into the world at, at one of the great times if you're going to catch the early waves of R&B that are happening in the city. You know? So you all may know about J&M Studio on Rampart Street, um, where um, uh, Fats Domino recorded The Fat Man, or you know, Little Richard recorded Tutti Frutti. It's an incredibly important place where R&B is happening at that moment. In the 50s. In the 50s, that's right, yeah. And, and so, you know, Art and others are hanging out outside and they're picking up gigs, uh, you know, kind of doing backup singing. Eventually, um, Art and Aaron form a group called the Hawkettes. Um, if you all know the song Mardi Gras Mambo, you know that, that song? You know, so that's, that's their recording at that time. So pretty early on in their lives, they are um, making waves in the R&B field in the city. Um, and you see then, um, uh, you know, um, 
Art start, has, has singles on his career, like Chudu Doo, which is, I think, 1957, and um, Aaron Neville, um, Over You, you know, Tell It Like It Is, important, 1967. Um, and they're playing together as well. Um, uh, there's a group called the Neville Sounds that um, is playing in the late 60s. I don't know if there, do you know if there are any recordings of the Neville Sounds around? I haven't. Mm, no. I, 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 I would pay grandly for right. one, <laughs> right. but as far as I understand, there are none. Yeah, so late, late 60s though, the Neville Sounds are playing around town at places like the Nightcap, which is on uh, Louisiana Avenue, and eventually Desert Sands, which is downtown, um, kind of like Claiborne and Esplanade, I think. Um, but they're, they're a great band with a kind of rotating cast of characters, um, kind of extraordinary um, band in the city. Um, and they get an opportunity, some of them do, to go and play at the Ivanhoe, which is on um, Bourbon Street. Um, and so Art leaves then with the rhythm section, okay, you know, so that's um, Zygmunt Alast on drums and George Porter on bass and Leo Nocentelli on guitar. And they become a band eventually known as the Meters. Right, out of that gig at, um, at the Ivanhoe, um, where Alan Toussaint, importantly, sees them there, and then kind of invites them to become the house um, band at the new, um, the new C-Sync studio. So um, that's kind of getting us up to about 1970, the backstory there. And so I, I liked, again, the ways in which the story of the Wild Chapatulas album has all of those roots that go pretty deep. Um, and we're just touching on one part of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so you just, took us up to 1970, right? And this album, The Wild Chapatulas, is from 1976. Talk to us about the tradition of Mardi Gras Indians, black masking Indians, and what the, the traditional music sounds like, because that's not entirely what is on the 1976 album. Yeah, all right, so that's a really important point. So, as you all may know, um, you know, and, you know the, the tradition of Mardi Gras Indians in the city goes back a long time, you know, at the very least to the 1880s, you know, um, Beckett Baptiste forms the Creole Wild West, probably a lot long, old, older than that, you know. Um, carnival in the city before then, less organized, probably groups around as well. It's at least that old, right? Um, it's a tradition where people, have, I think you could say, it's both kind of mystical societies and fraternal organizations, right? You know, so it's both, there's a, there's a kind of social aspect to it. There's also, I would say, a religious aspect to it. It has um, amazing um, sartorial dimensions or, or the, kinds of, the kinds of suits that are made every year, really extraordinary linguistic dimensions. Um, theatrical dimensions, the choreography is extraordinary, and musical dimensions. You know, so all of these things are going on, right? Um, and you make a really important point that we want people to understand, Melissa, about um, how the music that is traditionally performed on the streets by Mardi Gras Indian tribes is different from the music we get on the record, right? Um, you're talking about, in that case, music that is um, call and response, you know, so it has an anti formal structure, right? You know, um, you, you have um, uh, accompaniment on hand percussion, right? So, um, you know, kind of polyrhythmic um, you know, accompaniment to um, some call and response um, uh, chants of, of traditional styles. Um, in a minute we could maybe play, play something that sounds, sound, you know, to give people a sense of what, what that's like. It's important though to understand that this is like deeply African music though. When we talk about the kind of essential practices of music in the African diaspora, thinking about how call and response works and how different rhythms interlock to a key rhythm, you know, um, in, in the way that happens, this is, this is the music that is being played there. Um, so it's a tradition then that descends from the late 19th century all the way to today um, in those styles. And it's the case then, as, as you were suggesting, that something very interesting happens in those early years of the 1970s when people start to um, arrange these traditional um, songs um, in a new way. Yeah, and, and as we lead into that, you know, today if, if we were to encounter uh, the Mardi Gras Indians on the street or the Black Masking Indians on, on Super Sunday or St. Joseph's Night, uh, the, the music that they play on the street, they don't have guitars or, or, or keyboards. Okay. How do we get to that point. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, the, the key thing that happens 
is very interesting. Um, we actually know, sometimes like with a lot of like, the, where does jazz come from? Or where, like you don't know the answer, right? You know, there are all these kinds of stories that people tell. In this case, we actually know. You know, and as you know, it's like a crazy thing. At Tulane University, your employer, you know, um, the, um, at, there was a, a, jazz, a jazz festival that happened that was organized by Quint Davis. Uh, that featured um, w Willie T and his band The Gators, and also featured Bo Dallas and the Wild Magnolias. Um, and by some way, it was decided that um, they should play together. So we have, we have the recording. Should we play the recording of that? Yeah, I would love to hear that. And before we do that, just for reference, like Quint Davis, for those who don't know, he is the what, the, the CEO, the director of, of festival productions that, that is, is over the New Orleans Jazz and, and uh, Heritage Festival, one of the, the co-founders of that festival, and he was a student at Tulane University. So he literally, like the, the Tulane Jazz Festival is like one of the student programs. And as a student, he brings these two things together, traditional music, and uh, with contemporary music, the new sound, the funk sound, the electric keyboards and, and the, the guitars and the trap drums as opposed to hand percussion. So um, yeah, Tulane University plays a, an interesting role in this story, but the, the, the Indians were the wild magnolias, right? That's right, so, those so, are the wild magnolias. Okay, so we'll yeah. talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So let me, I'll just play like the beginning of it, just to get, it's, it, you know, it's, it's kind of chaotic sounding, but it's kind of exciting that you can actually listen to the beginning, right? Often you can't, sorry. So I'll just give you all a little piece of it. Good evening and welcome to the second annual Tulane Jazz Festival. At this time, Tulane takes pride in presenting Bo Dallas and the Wild Magnolia Mardi Gras Indian Band, backed up by Willie T and part of the New Gators. Thank you very much. That was Point Davis. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know. It's it's available actually on a number of CDs now as a kind of bonus track. But I think it's fascinating. You know, and, you know, its historical importance is extraordinary. But I think it's also kind of great how kind of loose and chaotic it is. Yeah, and you could tell listening to it, it's it's grainy. It's so it's live, but it also shows that it, it survived <laughs> um, um, some degradation, you know, it, it's going in and out and there had to have been some, some preservation on that, that particular recording. So, so Wild Magnolias, how does, how does the Wild Magnolias Mardi Gras Indian group influence the Wild Chapatulas? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, there's, so there's a next step, so, so Bo Dallas, Essential and also already an innovator. For instance, he started having you know different kinds of hand drums, congas, and stuff already in the 1960s. Um, uh, but um, after that recording, or after that that concert we were just listening to, um, uh, there was um, an idea to record a, a first track. You know, so Honda Wanda Part One and Two gets recorded um, also um, for for Quint Davis's Mardi Gras records in Baton Rouge. Um, and it's kind of, it's pretty stripped down sounding. It's, it's great, I love, I love that single, you know. Um, it's just, um, Zig Modelast, who's actually also the meters drummer, who's the drummer on um, the Wild Chapatulas is there, and, and Willie T and um, uh, George French. Um, there's that, 
then they do two records that are pretty extraordinary, I think. Um, you know, where Willie T is again kind of in charge of the band behind them. And um, there's like pretty heavy production and lots of like wah wah pedals and reverb and stuff. It's almost like a, a future, you know, Afro futurist in some ways in this production, I think. And it's kind of extraordinary. Two records um, The Wild Mag Noise and They Call Us Wild. Um, uh, so Jolly, George Landry, um, was. was masking with um, the Wild Night Noise at that time, and so was kind of inspired by this idea and this example. Um, to, um, he eventually then started his own tribe and then was inspired by the example of the Wild Magnolias to record with his nephews who, who had quite a bit of experience in the music industry. Okay, so you mentioned Big Chief Jolly, George Landry, um, was with the Wild Magnolias, but what is the history of the Wild Chapatulas? So it's founded, Wild Chapters is founded in 1974, um, based, coming out of a place that was called the Patio Lounge, which is on um, Chapatula Street, which is now, I think it's now 45, or is it still 45? 45 Chap still 45 Bar. Chap yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and um, it was, you know, at late night, um, you know, Jolly and some friends decided to, to begin this organization, you know, and so you hear, you know, so on, this is important, on the record we've talked about, you hear the meters, you hear the Neville Brothers, Right. The Neville Brothers again recording for the first time together. But crucially, you also have, you know, not only Jolly but also Norman Bell, Booker Washington, Carl Christmas, and Amos Landry. So the, you know, the kind of leaders from the Wild Top Duelists are there singing, you know, the, the mostly the choral responses. Um, and so, you know, they are really important. Um, uptown organization. You know, um, they they are also quite prominent. I would say in a lot of kind of documentation and art, especially documentary cinema of the late 1970s. So like Always for Pleasure, the Les Blanc movie, really has the Wild Chop Tools at the center of explaining what's happening with Mardi Gras Indians in the city. Um, there's also a documentary by um, uh, uh, Jason Berry um, and, um, and, and others um, called um, Up from the Cradle of Jazz that talks, has extensive ne interviews with the Nevilles and um, also you know, features the Wild Chop Tools as a kind of represent like representative of the tradition at the time. So this book centers all of those stories, but also this album from 1976. And the album, The Wild Child of represents a lot of things that I'd love to chat about. First of all, the, the origins of the Neville Brothers. And also, interestingly enough, um, a major label, Island Records. So, so let's get into that, the, the Neville Brothers connection on this album, why are they a part of this album, and their, their musical contributions, and then also how a major record label like, like Island Records, who, who on their roster, Bob Marley, uh, weren't the Sex Pistols? On? No, 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 that was Vernon, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, Robert Palmer, and many pop acts. How does that happen? Yeah, um, I mean, so, so the Island Connection comes through Alan Toussaint. Um, you know, so, so this is an important part of the story. So the Meters are the house band um, at Alan Toussaint's C. Saint Studios. And so they are playing behind, you know, if you know like Nightbirds, the LaBelle album, and all that, like you're getting like serious kind of meters action there. Sometimes you don't know it. They are the house band there. That's where the connection comes from. It, you know, so you've got Paul McCartney coming to town and working through there. So there is a kind of, there's some big label energy that is happening through the studio. Um, and so um, that also made the, the the group we know is the meter is also kind of essential in some ways because of the studio involvement. So, um, uh, so that, that's how that. I mean, it was. It came together pretty quickly. Charles Neville was not living in town at the time, but he, you know, came back as as the idea came came together. People tell stories about Big Chief Jolly walking around, you know, kind of taking taking notes on little, you know, pieces of paper with ideas for the the arrangements, um, and it came together, I think, quite quickly. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the Nevilles have careers in music, you know, that extend way back, you know, um, in, in various ways. Um, and they had certainly performed together in some of those other bands in the late 60s. Um, it was really the case, though, that um, it was this 
particular performance that led to the formation of the Neville Brothers. You get in 1977, they talk a lot in their really great collective autobiography with David Ritz, um, you know, the brothers, you know, like they talk a lot about this residency they had in Dallas in 1977 for a month, you know, like stayed in an apartment together and played, you know, played all the time, being really important, but it comes right after the album. So um, it, it's, it's really the case that, um, the, that that whole kind of enterprise and then the succeeding albums like come come out of the energy um, that happens through this recording session. Um, yeah. And your book details all of this, so I'd actually like to to pivot a little bit to your role in the book, your writing process. Yeah. You're you're using archival materials or, or, or notes. What was your process in writing this book? Well, you know, like, so I, I well, an important first thing that I did about this book is that I, um, I went and talked to Howard Miller, um, who was at the time kind of the president of the Marty Bryan Dean Council, and made an arrangement where all the royalties would go to the council. Uh, it seemed important to do. Cultural property is an important issue um, around these traditions. That's not an answer to the question of cultural property, but it's at least a kind of practical <coughs> approach, you know. So we just talked for a long time, and we, we made that arrangement happen. Um, I then tried to talk to more people. I'm not an interviewer, Melissa. You know, like I'm not. I have friends who are journalists, you know, and like they will like not let a story go. You know, they'll be like at your back door. And the first thing in the morning, we're knocking on your door trying to get the interview. You know, I'm not really like that. I talked to, I talked to some people. I did speak to, um, to Charles on the phone before he passed. Um, I, and I had some kind of email conversations with his wife with Missing Martellas. But the interesting thing that I found as I talked to people was that a lot of people didn't remember all that much, right? Um, and so it kind of became more of an archival project. I mean, for two reasons. One, like my own disposition. I'm kind of like some of you all know, I'm kind of a shy person. You know, like I'm not going to. You know, like if someone doesn't get back to me, I'm not. I'm gonna be like, should I call them? You know, like I'm, I don't know what they're. You know, I'm not. I'm not necessarily gonna work that way. It's also the case, though, that there were extraordinary interviews that were done much earlier. Some of which are in the Hogan Archive, which you now direct. Mm -hmm. um, some of which um, appeared in Wavelength. You know what a really fun thing to do is to, is to go to the UNO website and look at the old copies of Wavelength up there. You can see like, who is playing a you know, Little Queenie and the Percolators are playing at Jimmy's on whatever, you know, May 2nd, um, 1982. Um, Connie Atkinson, who's amazing, you know, the kind of force there behind that. Um, so, um, so there were a lot of, so I wound up being much more archival. You know, I mean, it was fortuitous, I think. Um, David Cunian also, um, uh, incredibly generously gave me a deep set of interviews that he did in the 1990s with everyone involved, which are probably the most important interviews that I have um, for the book. Um, so that was the kind of, the beginning of the process was really, it, it turned into an archival thing, slightly on accident or because of my weird sensibility, um, but that, that turned out to be really powerful in part because of the amazing work that had been done, um, the tradition documenting itself, journalists in town documenting the tradition kind of as it was happening and immediately in its wake. Um, and so that was um, that was the kind of, I think, how the ball got rolling. Okay. I have a question about the sound of the Wild Chapatulis okay. album, but before I ask, maybe we can listen to a clip what, of... Yeah, what do we want to hear? Do we want to hear Brother John? Or we want to hear? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Let's hear Brother John. <laughs> this is the opening of the album. My computer's asleep. Technology is terrible. <laughs> I was going to ask the difference in the sound between the Wild Chapatulas album and, and the Wild Magnolias oh, there's a style. Lot, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Shadow Moves Me Now Here. Shadow Moves Me Now Here. And if you don't laugh at the big cheese, you just shot the book me now. Shot the book me now. Shot the book me now. If you don't laugh at the big cheese, you just shot the book me now. Shot the book me now. Shot the book me now. If you don't laugh what the big cheese say, you just shot and both me down. If my brother, 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 John is gone. Hey now, brother, 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 John is gone. Well, I'm the camel of the corner, remember me well. Brother, John is gone. Well, I remember the morning, my brother's gone down. Brother, John is gone. Brother John, and the rest 
and that sounds a little different from that, you know, as you mentioned, guitar wah wah funk sound from the Wild Magnolias, which recorded 1974, 1975. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's different, and it also, importantly, too, both of those sound different from the more traditional sound you still would hear on the street, right? You know, um, and so. Maybe that could be a place to start, like how this kind of music that's, you know, it's in three, four minute units, you know, that you would hear on the radio, you know, um, it has often, including Brother John, it has a verse and chorus form, you know, so like in a pop song, you've got a, a, a verse and then the refrain comes, you don't have that, um, you know, kind of if you're chanting on the street, right, so that's another kind of difference. You also have um, chord changes, you know. So, like the, the music, you know, in when you're if you're out chanting, like you have someone who's the leader who's improvising, but then people are just responding in unison, right? Um, here, you've got the Neville, you've got the Neville brothers, right? And, you know, so you've got these like beautiful four-part harmonies, but you also though then have a set of chords, you know, that are kind of like sitting under those harmonies that kind of make all make sense. So. Um, I was really, um, when I started to write the book, really interested in that question of arrangement. Like, how do you take this particular vernacular form and make it into a kind of pop song, right? Um, I do think that it's different from, um, and it's hard for me because the wide manuals aren't, aren't one thing for me. You know, I feel like the early recordings sound different from the, the, two, the two main records, you know? Um, I do think that the, um, the, the harmony vocals here and the way that they work um, is is something that really makes um, quite quite an extraordinary difference. I think there's a there's something that's kind of loose and appealing about how the rhythms work here too. They're often kind of um, fit through the clave, which is a kind of Afro-Cuban kind of form of, of rhythm that organizes almost every song in this album. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that those differences are, are interesting, but they also, again, as you were suggesting before, point to things like the formation of the Neville Brothers, where the style of singing is so important to it, but also looking back as well to R&B. This album, again, was released on a major record label, Island Records, which had a reputation for um, pop music, but also reggae music. Right. You know, the, the superstar, Bob Marley. And uh, I always think about what was the strategy of marketing New Orleans Mardi Gras Indian music outside of New Orleans. What, how was this album received? It, it didn't actually do so well. You know, I mean, it's a funny thing. It was a big hit in the city. Outside of the city, it didn't sell so many copies, you know, and so, so that's, that, that, you know, that, that's an interesting fact to think about. Um, in terms of that, quickly, and there's more to say about that. In terms of the Island Records connection, though, it is interesting because the Meters went on tour um, in the Caribbean in 1972, you know, and so there's already that kind of connection there. Songs like Soul Island, which is on Cabbage Alley, is a kind of ode to, you know, that time, and um, they, they started to play covers in their, um, you, know, com you know, Stop That Train, Bob Marley covers became a part of it. This continues to be pretty pronounced with, um, like, say, Cyril Neville and the Uptown All-Stars have a very pronounced kind of reggae kind of Jamaican um, set of commitments. But a lot of people kind of connect that to the time when they were down there touring with Mighty Sparrow in 1972. And you definitely get that on the record. You know, if you think about Meet the Boys on the Battlefront with the tune that comes from Rum and Coca-Cola, the, um, you know, the, um, uh, you know the, the old kind of Calypso song. Um, so that, that aspect of it, the ways in which it presents itself as a cosmopolitan music, you know, as a kind of pan-Caribbean music, as a pan-African music. That's, that's an important part of the record, for sure. Um, there's a funny way, though, in which, like, so it didn't sell many copies, it didn't have wide reach, but I think it had incredibly important influence, along with some other records, in kind of setting the terms by which people would understand New Orleans music in the succeeding decades. Like, it, it, when this album came out, it wasn't the case that you could go to a record store and there would be a bin that said New Orleans on it. Right, like now, you know, I go to Amoeba Records in San Francisco, and there's a bin there that says New Orleans, and it's got like this album and Rebirth and all these other kinds of things. There's something that's happening in the '70s where kind of the terms are set for the commodification of vernacular traditions in the city, right? Um, it's culture, right? Um, for um, both through like the recording studio, but also the tourist trade, right? So there's something that's very interesting that's happening has absolutely to do with the formation of jazz fests the founding of Tipitina's, the beginning of WWOZ, 
um, you know, kind of styles of documentary cinema and documentary photography that kind of set these iconic images, right, that then become a part of how the city sells itself. You know, and so there's this weird way, you know, so it might have like lost the battle of, of selling all of the, you know, as many records as you would want to sell. It didn't make any money on this record. Um, but it, in some ways it won the war in terms of like setting a, a kind of template for how to understand um, the city and um, the richness of its culture. This album, and I, I didn't look at the full list of the 33 and a third series books, but I'm almost willing that if it's not one of the few uh, books on a New Orleans music, it might be the only one. Right. I think it's the only one. And there are hundreds of these it's books. All, they're all like record, you know, it's all like mark, television marquee movies, like, which is a great album, you know, but it's like a particular sensibility. Yeah, I mean, the, there's books on Prince and... That's true. And, you know, Public Enemy, Fleetwood Mac, and the Wild Child Patula. <laughs> but back to what you were saying about the commodification and the cultural property. Yeah. What are the issues around yeah. around that? Yeah, I mean, think about. I mean, one of the places in which you could think about it would be about um, taking people's photographs, right? So, um, if people are dedicating an extraordinary amount of their income and their lives, their time, to making amazing works of public art that they are sharing for free, having people take their photograph and then sell that photograph for an extraordinary amount of money without offering any recompense raises a question, right? You know, so people, people started to raise these questions pretty intensely in the 1980s. So Tambourine and Fan, um, an extraordinary civil rights organization formed by Jerome Smith, for instance, uh, uh, brought a lawsuit against the World's Fair in 1984 because they were using images of Mardi Gras Indians without their permission and without paying them any money. So this would be one example of it. Um, it's a common problem when you're thinking about kind of so-called vernacular cultures where allegedly it's no one's individual property, right? It's all part of the tradition. But it's pretty intensely the case here that um, since the 1980s, with the kind of birth of a new cultural economy, that um, is, is very central to how the city sells itself as a tourist destination, that the people who are iconic and central to that, that economy are often the last people paid, right? Everybody else gets their cut, right? And then you get paid at the end. And there's an irony about being symbolically central, right? And economically marginal. Um, and so that's when I, you know, and so this is, there are lots of ways into it, but that's, that's the way that I, I, I really think about it. And it's complicated. I feel like this is, a, this is a record that, again, sets the terms by which this thing went into motion, which probably has raised more questions than it has answered about appropriation, authenticity, cultural property. Mm. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to our audience for their questions. So these 33 and a third series books, they're all small. Um, in fact, this one is, is not more really than, than 100 pages. So easy it's 100, to- It's 101 pages. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you couldn't include everything. No. Is there anything that you wish you could have included but it just didn't make the, the editing cut? That's a really great question. Um, nothing immediately comes. To, I mean, so I'm a big fan of this idea of like the generative power of form. You know that like if someone, if you tell someone, say something to me in an elevator pitch or say it to me in like five words. You know, like I think that that's actually a, a, a thing that can really help your your imagination or your intellect come up with something powerful. I kind of liked the fact that they were like, and I bumped up against. You know, this is like this is the absolute maximum. You know, they made me edit it down, but I found that to be actually strangely, um, ex you know, helpful to the book. You know, that I had to kind of cut it down to the bare minimum of this big story I was telling. So yeah, I don't actually think about it that way. You know, like I, um, I, I was, I was happy to have the challenge of writing, um, in in the shorter form. Okay, that's awesome. All right, does anyone have any questions at all? I'll make a comment. Okay. I've never heard our culture explained with so many fancy words that I can't spell because I went to Orleans Public School. <laughs> I think I, I, I appreciate it. I'm going to look up all those words. 
Oh, oh, okay. I, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. Well, I would just like to say that I'm a graduate of the Morris Public Schools, and I, I found it um, very clear. But maybe I attended a later time. <laughs> More questions. I'd like to make a comment. I went to a private school in New Orleans, and I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I will ask one question about the writing. If there's anyone, because you know I'm a music person, and 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 every year the call for for book proposals comes out. You know anyone can write one of of these books, and every year I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do one on Mothership Connection by Parliament. And so, what is your advice for someone who would want to? to write one of these books, or, or any book on, on New Orleans music. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this series, it's weird. I have books, my, my experience is atypical. That's a fancy word, atypical. <laughs> um, but it was, um, it was weird because they had um, an, an editorial board um, uh, for a minute. It was um, Daphne Brooks and Amanda Petrusich and Gail Wald and some other people. And so like, I decided to do it right when they got on, because I was like, oh great, these are fantastic people. I'd love to have them edit my work. But then by the time I had finished a draft, they all quit en masse for being poorly treated by the series. So it was like, so Amanda was supposed to be my editor, and then and then you know she was gone. And so so I, I don't have I have this weird people ask me all the time like how do I get into the series, um, and I and I tell them that my experience is totally irrelevant um, because of the strangeness of when I came on and um, and how it happens. Um, so um, I think they do take open calls, as you know, every year. It's pretty it's pretty fun. You just like anybody can do it. You just you, you send in a, an, a you know a kind of quick proposal. Um, and gosh, how to write about? I don't know. I found it challenging to write about New Orleans music because it's like coming home in some ways and things that you care about that you want to do justice by, and you ask yourself, am I the right person to do this? You know, um, it felt uh, more personal than other kinds of writing um, I've done. And um, and so I don't I know, so it's funny I don't have an easy way of distilling advice about it. I'm glad that I threw myself into it. I think if I had thought too much about it, I might have hesitated, you know. And so I'm glad that I kind of like just threw myself into it and um, and discovered some pretty amazing things about the city. And then the editorial board that you mentioned. So again, this album, Wild Child Patulas in 1976, it was not a blockbuster pop hit or even a, a rhythm and blues chart hit for that matter. It was popular in the city. So how, was there any pushback from the editorial board saying, well, what is this album? Why would someone want to read about this? What was yes. the pitch yes. that, that, that sent it, that <laughs> made it successful? It helped that it was in the national recording registries whatever it is, essential records of the universe or something, you know, and so like, it was, um, I had to go back and they were like, what is this, you know, and I was, and so the funny thing is some of the hooks that I was describing to you all, like the fact that they are so central to, say, Les Blank's movie, you know, um, Always Your Pleasure, they knew that, right, you know, and so they were like, it was like finding the way, that was absolutely the question, though, like whether this album was important enough, and I was like, I mean, I was initially like, what? You know, like I, I was a little bit outraged, but then I kind of checked myself and tried to figure out some ways to explain it. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I hope you all thought of some questions while we have more conversation. <laughs> Who has a question? Oh, yes, in the back. Uh, so I'm curious about Adam Toussaint's role as a producer here. You know, it seems like one of the tricks of Marty writing music in the studio is like, how do you make, how do you track that? And uh, so I'm curious to know what you learned about it. No, this is a great question. Um, this album is essentially self-produced, you know, um, as, as everyone reports it across the board. And it's actually very interesting how it was set up um, because it's in this fancy multi-track studio, right? You know, where, I'm just so you all, you know, it's like usually in this kind of studio, you would have people record in isolation, you know, and then you would have engineers mix the different tracks together to get kind of good definition and you know dimension and depth you know to, to the recording um this record actually amazingly they recorded it all together in the same room without headphones on 
you know, so they could like look at each other and communicate just using head arrangements, you know. So I, I don't, you know, I, this is mostly working from interviews that other people did. I have no account of Alan Tucson being in the studio when it was recorded. So, um, you know, and so this, in some of the, the, the um, kind of tension that existed between the meters and Alan Tucson, their self-production of their work is also another theme that comes up there as well. So it's interesting how it was done. There are some other, there was overdubbing and other things that happened with it, but the story of how it happened at CSAN is really interesting. It's according to someone who I can't remember, the first time anyone recorded like that in one, one big room together in that studio, which was designed for a different kind of work. So um, there was definitely tension, um, I, I, I believe, um, Tucson still owned the publishing on a lot of songs on this album. They were never paid because the sales were not good. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't really know all of the details, but um, but there was definitely some bad feeling, I think, in the end, in terms of that relationship. Yes. Uh, you you spoke a lot of, about archive using archives of taking an archival approach, and I'm curious about whether or not there were any interviews that you really, really wish you would have, like, really gone after or persevered through your personality, you know, all the things that make you not that person. Because I, I am that person. I will knock on your door. I will call yeah. your phone. Yeah. I will find out who your grandma is. And all of that. So I, is, there, is there any um, interview that you really wish that you had done it? And, and then the second question, the second part of that question is, if you could go about it again, um, would you try to get more primary sources? Yeah. Again, this is the funny thing about it. Like, um, uh, the people that I did speak to, you know, um, and, I, and I, spoke, I, I spoke to a wide range of people who weren't necessarily in the room when the, the album was recorded. Um, the things that were most immediate, you know, you have to think about it now. This was, I was writing this in 2018, so it was about like, you know, 40 years ago or something, you know, and so a lot of people's memories just get a little bit foggy, you know, um, and, and so, um, uh, so it's a funny thing, like it was like an, an artificial constraint, the passage of time, my being somebody who, you know, wants to drink coffee and read a book rather than go and kind of like knock on people's doors, you know, like th those kinds of constraints though, I think were actually just by accident good for the book, you know, in that like people had, I mean, it, it, it's, it was an incredible blessing that these people had actually told their own stories before. Again, the book that they did, the, it's called The Brothers, they wrote that book, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, it's something, you know, they, they have a co-author, but that is, they are telling their own stories there, you know, and so, um, this is, uh, Charles actually said this to me, he said, look, we've, you know, we've kind of, we told the, we told the best version of the story already, you know, you can pick up that book. Um, and um, so I don't actually, it's a weird thing to say, um, but I'm not sure, I don't have any regrets about it. You know, like I, I feel like um, because um, so much incredible work had been done before, people, you know, kind of um, telling their own stories or other work had been done by um, especially local journalists to interview people and um, to get, you know, to, to get the story right, um, that it was possible for me to, to do justice to, to the album. Um, so I actually don't have regrets around there, um, but that's you know all all about um, the efforts I'm building on here. Do you have links to all those other? I do, I do, I do, and if you look in the back of the book too, so I've got um, so there there are um, you know um, uh, like citations of the things that I cite, but there's a list of things to go and go and read. Um, the first thing I was so one thing is go go visit Melissa at the Hogan mm -hmm. Archive. Um, okay. Where there are, I mean, an amazing number of extraordinary things. Go again, as I mentioned before, to the UNO website and look at old issues of Wavelength, which is like I had the original. Oh well, you don't even need to do that. That um, you know, th those would be two things. But then there is a whole list of suggested resources that can get you to everything that I, I, I work from. Yes. What was the wildest anecdote you came across when doing your research? That's an interesting, so the wildest anecdote. I think it's probably about, um, it's a story about Brother Tillman, um, who as you may know, is, he's a, um, he was a Mardi Gras, celebrated Mardi Gras Indian, like of the 1920s, so like a long time ago. Um, and interestingly, so Brother, you know, so the Brother John chant that we just heard a little bit, um, people have talked about how that, that was a way of eulogizing 
important people who had passed. So um, David Draper, who writes this interesting dissertation in the early 70s, talks about it being a song about um, you know, Brother Tillman. Um, but the story I want to tell you about Brother Tillman is that um, he was notorious. This was a time when things were more violent on, on, on the scene. He was notorious um, as, a, as a kind of fearsome Indian leader. Um, and um, the cops wanted to, to get him out of the way. Put, they wanted to put him in jail um, before Carnival came. And so he came up with a scheme. This is told by Paul Longpree to Jason Berry, and it's contained in um, the Hoga Jazz Archive. But according to Paul Longpree, um, he staged his own death. So he, he, um, he announced that he had it announced that he, he died, and he had his body in a casket taken to Holt Cemetery. And then while the, while the hearse was going to Herbst Holt Cemetery, he like got out of the casket and hid in the back of the hearse, right? And then they put it away, and the, the police were there, as Paul Lumpry tells the story, the police were there, and um, they were like, oh, okay, I guess that's the end, you know, of, of Brother Tillman. Um, but then on Mardi Gras, he shows up, and everyone's like, ah, you know. So that's, that's, that's your weird anecdote, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, well, I have just one more. We do have a little more time. Um, I love at the beginning of the book this maps section. There's a map section, so it, it, it references uh, places that you mention uh, the H and R bar, uh, and also the the significance and the relevance of the the story, the Ivanhoe bar, and 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 the patio lounge, which is is still there on top of Tula Street under the the name Forty Five Chop. So with that, a question about preservation. There is so much preservation around New Orleans jazz landmarks. And uh, the Hogan Archive, we recently did a rebranding uh, and renaming from the Hogan Jazz Archive to the Hogan Archive of New Orleans Music and New Orleans Jazz because we want people to know the scope of our collections of our music and that we do include Mardi Gras Indian uh, music and culture there. What do you have to say about how the culture, how the preservation and memory of Mardi Gras Indian music is in the city, and especially this moment where there's a convergence of, of, of popular music uh, with the traditional music to um, try and promote it commercially outside of the region. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, I, I think that there are some good, you know, between the Hogan and Historic New Orleans collection and other places, we have we have good archives like that. The House of Dance and Feathers, um, you know, Charlotte Minnie Minnie's reopening the House of Dance and Feathers next month, which is exciting. Um, we have we have good community museums and organizations dedicated to telling the story. Um, and so um, I think I think in a lot of ways um, there, there's there's a lot to be said about what we um, what what has been preserved um, and that kind of knowledge um, that has been passed down. Um, the map I love the I love doing the maps. Like I'm I'm very I'm very into maps um, and thinking about how that part of the city, especially kind of central city right around here, changed um, in those years. And thinking about this album in relationship to it, right? You know, like. He's, you know, Jolly singing about going down to Melt Me. You know, he's like going like right here, you know, mm -hmm. um, from the Golden Tracks, you know, from like over on Chapatulas, right? You get a kind of imagined geography of the city. You know, the Magnolia Bridge, which goes away in the late 30s. The Magnolia Bridge is going over the New Basin Canal, right? This is an important place in kind of the mythology of older Indian tribes in the city. But they're singing about it in 1975, 76, as if the Magnolia Bridge is still there. Right, so there's this cool way in which, like, the, the historical memory is like alive in the present tense, in the um, in, in, in the um, the you know, on the album in a way that I really like. The Metairie Ridge, all of these kinds of places. So the maps felt appropriate, but it's certainly the um, kind of changes that came in the wake of the closing of the New Basin Canal, the building of the Elevated Expressway. Mm -hmm. Right, it changed a lot of things. So the battlefield or the battlefront, we don't know exactly where it was, but it was right around there. You know, the, the, the kind of the, the dividing line between uptown and downtown tribes is all right around where the New Basin Canal and where now the expressway and the Superdome 
and you know the Amtrak train station are. So it's kind of interesting, right? You know, the Superdome is being built right when this album's coming out, but it's singing about these places as they were before all of this change came to that part of the city. So I feel like that kind of historical memory of the geography of the city is pretty powerful here and interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And last question. What is your favorite song on the album? Oh, man, that's so hard. <laughs> Mine is Engines, Here We Come. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a that's a really that's a really excellent one. I mean, I feel like you know, Hey Pocky Way, really important to me. Maybe I have to say Brother John. Hey Pocky Way, Brother John, meet the boys on the battlefront. Um, uh, Hey you know, Mama. Hey Mama. All hey of Mama them. Is incredible. <laughs> yeah, you, you, those are like the funky track. Yeah, no, Hey Mama is, a, hey Mama is a, incredible. Um, Big Chief got a golden crown. I mean, it's hard, it's hard for me to pick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your work and documentation. And thank you all for being here. And we also, one more time, especially want to thank our very special guest. Is it Augustine or Augustine? I've been called both, but Augustine. <laughs> Dr. Augustine of the Wild Chapatulas. And also Isaiah, who is family of the Nevilles and Big Chief Jolly. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Melissa. And the books are available for sale, right? And the area archives? Yes, yes, they are. OK, for sale. great. Yes, the books are available, so you have to have one for your collection. Is there a large print book for old people? <laughs> Not yet, not yet, but this is a good, it's a, it's a good, you must have to write very good. Tiny handwriting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Come back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning for Brian's next session, which is the Life Legend of Brock Oh, And just a quick note, I learned an hour ago that this session and the one before it are supported by the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Jazz and Heritage Foundation. See you tomorrow.